One of my earliest and fondest memories is of me standing on the front of my father's water skis. I was probably three or four at the time, and I'd put my feet right in front of the boot where his feet were, and I would hold on to his arms while he held the rope, and we would just ski around the lake. It felt like I could do that forever. Later, I learned how to ski on my own, but that first taste of gliding on top of the water was awesome for me. I loved how all it took was the tug of a boat to pull the two of us up, and my dad actually laughed when I reminded him about it recently. And he said, well, it helped that you were always a willing participant. And it's true, I absolutely loved it and could do it way longer than he could. I remember that vividly. In fact, a lot of my most vivid memories revolve around water. Beach trips where boogie boarding and body surfing were prevalent and caused a lot of sand in the bathing suit situations fishing off of the bridge near my grandmother's house in Florida. And I even distinctly remember the bright blue color of the big thermos we'd fill with water before soccer practice every week. The tone of my mother's voice when she would say, drink a glass of water, it'll fill you up, when we constantly searched for snacks 10 minutes before dinner was served. Water is powerful. It changes landscapes as rivers change course over time. It forms and melts glaciers. Too much water floods entire cities, while the absence of water causes forest fires in other parts of our country. Water has likely been on your mind a lot lately, especially if you tailgated a little bit too late last night. But in reality, water is probably on your mind because it can and recently has been destructive. Harvey, Irma, Maria, places like Puerto Rico, Flint, Michigan, North Dakota, and most of the developing world who may have water, but not the good kind, not the life-giving kind that you can drink. This brings up need for reform, for equal human rights. It brings up the need to discuss things like climate change, both in terms of immediate effects and of the future that we are creating for those who follow us. We are called as Christians to care for the earth that God has given us and all of the creatures that live on it with us. But I also think that God would want us to remember, especially now, that water is also life-giving. It fills our memories, it sustains our bodies, it shows up in our scripture, and it brings us into Christian community with one another and with Jesus Christ. Our lives revolve around water, if you think about it. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. The average human adult is over 50% water. We all, I'm sure, drink eight glasses of water every day. Water is a source of life, and a body can't survive all that long without it. Now, that all depends on the situation, of course. Temperature, humidity, activity level, etc. But nonetheless, a body can't survive very long without water. Even mild dehydration is uncomfortable, we know. Headaches, nausea, exhaustion, they seem to come more often than we'd like, reminding us to take a sip or two out of the water bottle sitting at our side, especially when it is hot or when we've been active. Now today, the Sinai Peninsula averages somewhere around 82 degrees Fahrenheit in May and more in the 90s in June. For those same months, the temperatures, um, the average high is 95 to in the hundreds. In such extreme heat and with extreme exposure to sun, the timeline for survival shortens considerably. Add to that the task of carrying all of your belongings with you, your tent, your clothes, what little food you might have, your children. It isn't hard to see that that would be a tough situation. So it's easy to see that the Israelites were not just whining when they confronted Moses about their lack of water. They were hurting, suffering the effects of going without water, and they were in the wilderness, in a place they didn't know far away from home, a place that God had sent them. We would probably do the same in that situation, too. We'd want to protect our loved ones also, to quench our own thirst. 
So in this time of thirst and desperation, in this life of being displaced, of going into the wilderness where God had sent them, the Israelites become a little unsure of their situation and maybe even begin to lose faith a little. After all, they were afraid, very thirsty for both actual water and a relationship with God. They needed a little help. They were wondering if God is supposed to be with them, why is there no water? And they felt like they had to do something because they didn't see anywhere else to turn. All of this frustration is focused toward Moses, their leader. And because of that, this angry mob of people, Moses becomes a little fearful for his life. He's afraid he's going to get stoned. Because while there isn't edible vegetation and while they can't find water, rocks were most likely very prevalent. So fearing for his life, Moses turns to the Lord. Go ahead of the people, God tells him, to the rock at Horeb, and I will be there. So now Moses has to go through this thirsty mob of people who are upset, who are afraid that they are watching their children die, to come to the rock. Moses has to work a little, to ask God for help, and to make himself vulnerable to the Israelites in order to get to God. Now you may recall that this is the same place where Moses received his call. It's a thin space for him. This is where the burning bush was. So Moses returns to the rock at Horeb and strikes it with the same staff that he's been carrying around for what seems like forever. The same staff with which he struck the Nile. And out of the rock he struck came water. It seems like Moses was the agent that saved the Israelites. And he did have to turn to God, but he wasn't the source of this life-giving water. That was God. Because everything good comes from God. God gave the Israelites life through water, but more importantly here, God satiated their thirst for a relationship with God and gave them another sign of God's grace and presence with a second chance to believe when they were struggling. They needed only to ask. They tested the Lord. They were struggling and they needed to see a sign. They were thirsty, they were dying, and their faith maybe wavered a little bit. But God was there. God could have scoffed and said good riddance, but instead Moses struck a rock and out came water. That water flowing from God provided both the physical necessity of hydration, but also a much needed sign of grace and love. God didn't abandon the Israelites in their time of need, but instead renewed the relationship with them. There are signs of God all around us, and God sends us signs when we ask, when we need them most. How do I know? Well, because this is the same God who sent Jesus to be among us as a sign of love. He sent Jesus to teach us to renew our relationship with God, to quench our thirst for something more, and to teach us the way to salvation. But as we all know, humans tested Jesus too. The Pharisees questioned by what authority Jesus taught. After all, he wasn't elected to his position. He wasn't trained in the traditional ways. In their estimation, he just declared himself a prophet. So where does he get the permission, the authority, to teach out of the temple? The Pharisees don't like what they see. They feel threatened even. So here they are questioning Jesus. Looks like they maybe need a sign. Of course, you might know what happens next in our story. We often think, why won't these people believe Jesus already? But Jesus, the forgiver and grace giver that he is, gives them a second chance to believe. And he asks his own question. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Now, this was a tricky one for them. The Pharisees knew that denouncing the baptism of John wouldn't go over very well with the crowds. But if they acknowledged that it was from heaven, Jesus would likely follow up by asking if they believe in that and why they didn't submit themselves to it. 
So stuck in a pickle, they kind of sink away and say, probably under their breath, I don't know. They're afraid to admit what John's baptism is all about. That John was sent by God as a sign. Because even they know how powerful the waters of baptism are. How infectious faith in God can be. And how the people turning to God would likely put them out of business. God is that powerful. And the great news for us is that God is always there. Even when we are thirsting for God, God is with us. And water is a sign of not only God's love, but of God's presence in our lives. When we need it most, God will send a sign, like the rock at Horeb. Constant, present, solid, life-giving. God is always there waiting for us to turn to God. And it is through turning to God, our rock, that we are strengthened. We are baptized into the body of Christ through water, and through water God is always with us, always a part of us, a never-ending relationship, constantly being renewed. Life springs forth from God, turning this thing that can be so destructive into something that is also life-giving, that is transformative, like God is transformative, like turning to God is transformative. It is through water that we are initiated into the body of Christ, and it is through water that God shows us we are not alone in this world, that we are loved, that we deserve mercy, and that God will always sustain us. So if your faith wavers, if you find yourself ever struggling, ask God for a sign. But then make sure that you open your heart to what that sign might be. Maybe it's the beauty of nature or the giggle of a child, the unconditional love of your pet, or the sparkle of water you see on the lake. Maybe the renewal of your baptismal vows. Water feeds us and cleanses us and saves us. And in all times, we need God like we need water. And I pray that as our lives naturally revolve around water, that we will also focus our lives to revolve around God. Amen.